Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of Addressing Chronic Violence from a Gender Perspective, Fostering People-Centered Approaches at the National Level, a report created through the Women Peacemakers Program. This event is the culmination of an 11-month fellowship that began over a year ago. The Peacemaker Fellows you will hear from today are fantastic, and it's so great to have them with us again. My name is Andrew Blum. I'm the Executive Director of the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego's Kroc School of Peace Studies. And it's my honor to welcome you and kick off our event today. The core of the Kroc IPJ mission is to co-create learning with peacemakers, learning that is deeply grounded in their lived experience and then is made rigorous by our place within a university ecosystem and learning that is immediately and practically applicable by our peacemakers to end cycles of violence. Since 2002, the Kroc IPJ has hosted the Women Peacemakers Fellowship Program. The fellowship offers a unique opportunity for women peace builders from around the world to engage in a cycle of learning, practice, research, and participation. The Women Peacemakers Fellowship facilitates collaboration between women peacemakers from conflict-affected communities and international partner organizations. The fellows co-create research intended to shape the peacebuilding field and highlight good practices for peacebuilding design and implementation. The, the report you will hear about today was co-created by the three 2022-23 Women Peacemakers Fellows. Naticia Bohard Singh from Jamaica, Dolores Hernandez from Mexico, and Tanya Martinez from Honduras, and was supported by members of leading international peacebuilding organizations who provided their own expertise and perspectives to shape the work. The report is based on the lived reality of these women peacebuilders and peacebuilding partners and provides both concrete recommendations and in depth, context specific analysis through the case studies. The report we are discussing today focuses on chronic violence, which affects communities around the world. In particular, this report addresses how chronic violence is a gendered phenomenon and encompasses many types of violence. Many communities around the world are engulfed in armed conflict, armed conflict places like Israel and Palestine, Ukraine, Myanmar, and many others. We have witnessed horrible sexual and gender-based violence in places such as Israel, Yemen, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Women and LGBTQ plus people face gendered oppression in places such as Afghanistan and Uganda. Unfortunately, the list could go on and on. We are proud to partner with women peacebuilders around the world who are working to address these crucial and pervasive issues. In this event, we are not able to address all of these issues with the nuance and detail they deserve. Today, we're launching a report that centers the experiences and context of our three Women Peacemakers Fellows from Honduras, Jamaica, and Mexico. So we will be discussing chronic violence, and we will focus on those three contexts in particular. Now I want to turn it over to Brianna, Mamba, Brianna Mabi the Program Officer for Women, Peace, and Security at the Kroc IPJ, who will lead us through the rest of our event today. Brianna, over to you. Thank you, Andy, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I'm so excited to launch this report today. It's been such a privilege to work with these fellows and these partners over the last year, and we're just so excited to launch in both English and Spanish. So I hope you'll take a moment after today's event to read the full report. As Andy said, we'll be talking about chronic violence today. And so I wanna open just a bit with what does that mean? How are we thinking about that issue? And then you'll be hearing more directly from our fellows and from our partners. We often think about violence as through the lens of armed conflict or specific concrete violent incidents, but it's necessary to understand that violence may be a chronic phenomenon, a persistent and deeply ingrained issue that affects daily lives. Chronic violence is often overlooked misunderstood or perhaps not considered to be relevant to the peace building field. And our report really seeks to fill that gap, especially using a gendered lens. 
This report contributes to the study of chronic violence in three distinct ways. The research centers gendered experiences and perspectives on chronic violence. The findings are based on the insights and research of authors living in context experiencing chronic violence. And the report focuses primarily on the connection between national and international level policy to address chronic violence. Women and marginalized gender groups experience a particular type of chronic violence stemming from deeply rooted patriarchal structures. These experiences, while diverse, share a common thread. They are manifestations of systemic oppression and inequality from domestic violence to broader societal discrimination. We're thinking about chronic violence using a particular definition put forward by Tawny Adams. So we're thinking about chronic violence as being something that is provoked and reproduced by multiple factors. It's not a single source. It becomes embedded in social spaces, which can undermine social relations and create destructive behaviors that then become normalized over time and can obstruct and undermine public engagement. This type of violence has both acute and chronic manifestations. It can occur over a long period and can disrupt lives across generations. Our report emphasizes that chronic violence is pervasive and endemic, not episodic. It affects women and LGBTQ plus people in distinct ways. And in turn, these people are key for addressing and responding to chronic violence. Nuanced, holistic, and people-centered approaches are required to address this issue. Our panelists today are going to dive much more deeply into how to understand chronic violence and how to build those gender responsive people centered approaches. It's now my privilege to introduce Dr. Phoebe Donnelly, who served as one of the international partners for this work. Phoebe, thank you so much. It was a privilege to have you as part of this cohort. She's the head of the Women, Peace and Security Program at the International Peace Institute and is an adjunct assistant professor at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Welcome, Phoebe. Thank you, Brianna, and thank you to the whole Croc Institute. It has been a real pleasure to be a part of this project, and I'm excited to welcome you all to the launch, launch of this timely publication entitled, Addressing Chronic Violence from a Gendered Perspective, Fostering People-Centered Approaches. As Brianna mentioned, this year, my colleague Evan Papworth and I had the distinct privilege of being an international partner for the Women Peacemakers Fellowship at the Kroc Institute. We enjoyed working with Tanya Martinez on her research and learned an incredible amount from each of the fellows who contributed to the report being launched today. We offer sincere congratulations to the fellows for their hard work on such an important topic. At IPI, we seek to elevate the voices of women peace builders in our mission to connect women and gender experts with policymakers to advance the women peace and security agenda. Our work focuses on the future of the women peace and security agenda, and we look to opportunities to expand the agenda and make it more inclusive to reach the goals of gender equality and enhance peace and security for all. The Women's Peacemakers Fellowship, which I was impressed to hear is in its 21st year, is one opportunity for us to learn from a community of global peacekeepers across the world. Their knowledge is a resource we should all continue to leverage. To speak more about this report and its focus, the policy community, particularly within the UN, we're situated at IPI in New York, right across from the UN, and the UN has been focusing renewed attention on issues related to chronic violence. For example, the Secretary General of the UN published a policy brief this year on the new agenda for peace that highlights the main security challenges of today and for the future. One of the challenges the Secretary General discusses is around persistent violence outside of armed conflicts. The new Agenda for Peace report notes the gender differences and the impact of this violence outside of armed conflict, as well as the link between misogyny and different forms of violence. The groundbreaking work in the report being launched today speaks to these policy conversations and importantly demonstrates that a comprehensive understanding of, violent, of chronic violence when viewed through a gender lens is critical for devising effective strategies for peace so social cohesion and sustainable development. Our team at IPI recently wrote about the need to apply the Women, Peace and Security agenda to gendered experience of violence beyond context of armed conflict. And we are so glad to be able to leverage Tanya's insights from her case study on Honduras. So we will share that 
Global Observatory link either in the chat or later when we follow up with all of the attendees. So building off of what Brianna mentioned, I want to highlight what I see as three significant contributions from this report. First, the way in which the report discusses gender and chronic violence is both clear and impactful. To quote the report, chronic violence is both a gendered and gendering phenomenon, meaning chronic violence is affecting gender dynamics and roles and is affected by gender dynamics and roles. The report also makes the link between chronic violence and the gendered continuum of violence to demonstrate that violence is neither episodic nor isolated, but it's embedded and normalized within the fabric of societies. Second, the report showcases an intersectional gender analysis and why it matters. Not only does the report show how women, girls, and marginalized gender groups experience chronic violence differently than men and boys, but the report takes this further by, de by demonstrating how identity factors alongside gender influence experiences with chronic violence. The chapters in the report look at gender alongside sexuality, age, educational status, economic status, and shows how these identity factors complement gender to impact experiences with chronic violence. The chapters in the report demonstrate that we can focus on the ways in which women are victimized by chronic violence while also seeing their agency and recognizing their leadership and expertise in addressing chronic violence. It's often hard for us all to hold these two truths alongside each other, and the report illustrates why we must challenge ourselves to not simplify women's experience. I also value the way in which each of these chapters gives us the chance to learn from the experiences of diverse groups of women across and within these three countries. Finally, the report makes the important connection between international policy frameworks and the experiences of chronic violence at the national level. Specifically, the three case studies in the report link to three international frameworks the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDA, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. There is potential for the principles and practices in these frameworks to be integrated and strengthened within national level policies. I'll stop there, but I encourage everyone to use this report as a resource. resource. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you again for your partnership through this work. Now we will turn to a panel of the three fellows who co-created this research, along with the lead researcher on the project, Dr. Elena Stavidevska, who is a lecturer in international relations at the University of Bristol. She will in turn introduce each of our panelists. As a reminder, we'll take questions after the formal panel questions. So please put any questions you have in the Q&A box. Welcome Elena, Noticia, Dolores, and Tanya. Thank you so much, Brianna. It is really an honor to be here today um, and to see this report uh, finally being produced, taking a final shape. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful year collaborating together, and I'm really, really excited to share um, this panel with the women peacemakers who will share um, the findings from each of their case studies. So uh, as a, again, as a reminder, as Brianna just said, if you feel inspired and a question pops up as, um, as the uh, Women Peacemaker Fellows um, speak, please put it in the chat box uh, and we'll try to pick, uh, pick it up at the end. Okay, so without further ado, first we have um, Dolores Hernandez, who has worked in program design and implementation with various global organizations to strengthen international and local um, decentralized uh, sorry, decentralized cooperation efforts for urban development and safety. And it is precisely this experience and this knowledge that um, Dolores brought to her case study. So Dolores, um, can you tell us uh, a little bit, uh, please, drawing on your case study, which focused on Guadalajara, um, how people experience chronic violence and how that experience is specifically gendered? Good morning and good afternoon for whatever in the world you are uh, watching us. Thank you, Helena, and it's great to be here with you. Well, when we talk about 
uh, violence in Mexico is commonly translated to insecurity. And I think that's one of the challenges. Um, this cannot be understood only from one simplified perspective. So the problem of violence in Mexico is not only about law, uh, common law crimes or organized crime, but actually the intersection of all those factors that contribute to chronic violence. Um, and in this context, how in parallel, um, this creates also these levels of insecurity in which we live in. Um, this happens in all spaces, public and private. And it's a consequence of uh, different factors such as poverty, inequality, unemployment, corruption, impunity. Um, this is uh, reflected in, in the chapter and is lived in, in people's daily basis. Um, when you talk about insecurity and crime in Mexico, we have a rate of, of over 75% of people feeling reported feeling unsafe in the country. Um, a common law crime uh, rate over 1,700 per 100,000, a national rate of homicide 3.78, that which is way high level than the global average. And in some places in Mexico, we even got to 150 homicides per 100,000 people. And this is when only 10% of the crimes estimated uh, that, that are reported, 90% of the crimes go unreported in Mexico. When you listen to these figures and then go back home and think, well, life goes on. That's the clear evidence of how we experience violence and chronic violence and how we have normalized. Because when you learn to live under such levels of crime and insecurity, that's the real life that we've been living and we've been normalizing violence in our community. Even with those levels of insecurity, people report to feel satisfied in general with their life. 80% of people in general feel satisfied. But when you disaggregate um, this satisfaction or dissatisfaction in our daily basis, um, some of the findings that I have is that, for example, people start reporting not satisfied or not like, well, life goes on, life is such in Mexico, but there are different um, levels of um, dissatisfaction or challenges regarding economy health, education, housing, mobility, environment, public spaces, governance, and of course, safety. So this is all embedded, and that's a huge challenge. And that's what I, I try to, to report in my case study. People have normalized uh, in such level the violence that they compare to other neighborhoods, and they kind of have a relief when they are not the worst neighborhood in the city which is um, harsh uh, to see. There are also some um, understanding of um, um, some intergenerational aspects. Adults who stereotype Jews, the Jews, uh, and identifying them as perpetrators of crimes or offenses or drug users. And the Jews has normalized this so much that they've been born and raised in a context that they develop and normalize self-protection and individual methods to survive, which is not normal, but we have learned to live with it. And well, how is, is gender? This context is even worse for women. Um, over 70% of women uh, above 15 years have experienced at least one incident of violence in their life. And we have a rate of over 10 feminicides daily. Those are really huge numbers. And of course, when you talk about, as Phoebe was saying, when you talk about the way uh, women live uh, the city, it goes even uh, deeper because when you talk about economy, health, women um, are considered that, consider themselves to have uh, less access to uh, health services or, or worse or more health problems regarding employment, of course, there is this uh, wage um, uh, gap. And um, it is this kind of uh, punishment when women find um, a way to live or employment. That means that it, there is certain sacrifice in homes. And one particular data, and I'm going to finish with this, that I was uh, kind of, uh, of surprise is that when we went out to the three neighborhoods to question about where people felt 
more insecure, uh, most of the people replied that they were on the streets, public bus stops, outside their homes, and the safer place for people is their homes. But when we asked them about if women were um, victims of violence in their neighborhood and where those women were suffering violence, the second option and three options in all uh, the neighborhoods, in the three neighborhoods, was that women suffer most violence incidents at home. So for some people, the safer place is also the unknown safe place for women, which makes it uh, harder. Um, I will leave it there. I will invite you to go and, and read the report. Thank you so much, Dolores. Um, and thank you for your powerful words uh, today, but also your powerful findings um, in, the, in the case study. Next up, we have um, Naticia Nerene Bojartzing, who is a lawyer and an advocate. Um, she is the founder of Children of the Mas Mafa, Recognition Justice and Development Project, which promotes the rights, welfare, and interests of all people of African descent in Jamaica and the Caribbean. So Noticia uh, focused on Jamaica in her case study. Uh, your case study, Noticia, focuses specifically on gender-based violence, which is a particular manifestation of chronic violence, uh, as was mentioned earlier as well. Tell us about how the legal and policy frameworks in Jamaica um, in particular do or do not really support survivor, survivors of gender-based violence. Thank you so much, Alina, and greetings everyone from Jamaica. Um, the, the legal and policy framework in Jamaica do su support survivors of GBV, but in a very limiting way, in, limiting in the sense of who can get particularized protection and limiting in the sense of the legislative framing, whether it may be protective or preventative. Now, the Parliament of Jamaica has taken steps to adopt and implement legislative frameworks and other measures towards dealing with the problem of GBV in the society. And there is a proposed intention in the National Strategic Action Plan to eliminate GBV of the strategic priorities towards prevention, protection, intervention, and the general legal procedures along with protocols for data collection, which is always important. However, there is still no legislative follow-ups to enact a general national legislation to deal with GBV in all its manifestations in which we know the, the forms and ways in which it affects various populations. Now, the current GBV laws are still organized in a piecemeal fashion in the country. So for example, there is the Domestic Violence Act with its own prescriptions on the one end. There is a Sexual Harassment Act, both with limited jurisdictions and remedies. And at the advocacy level in the country, the focus is often on violence against women, because of course the phenomena is deemed to be harsher on women and girls in the society. However, we see that the legislations and the policy frameworks, along with their mechanism, fail to recognize GBV outside of the, the heteronormative framings that everyone here would have come to understand to be the form that GBV takes, takes shape and for, at place in. So that ultimately excludes the experiences of transgender, intersex, and non-binary people for whom gender is central to the experience of violence. We, we find also that GBV, as was explained, at it, which um, as, a, as a manifestation of chronic violence, affects women and LGBTQ plus people in distinct ways. The country has a very, has a rooted historical past, and therefore all the legislations that we have that deals with the offenses against the person, which trickles down into the Sexual Offenses Act, they form part of how gender is seen in the country, how violence is seen in the country. So women, as we know, and marginalized gender groups are excluded their experiences, even though they are impacted in particular ways. Um, this impact is rooted in the patriarchal structures, which create the oppression and the inequality in the country. Here in Jamaica, the structures either create or enforce the legislative frameworks, and it is perpetuated by the institutions. We have what I, I consider to be a cohesive system of marginalization, where the human rights and the legislative dialogues boil down to what um, Jackie Alexander, one of our, gen, uh, our feminist um, authors, explain as citizenship. So in a good 
Christian society, it is who is deemed as a legitimate citizen is thereby worthy of protection. We see this in the Domestic Violence Act, which was enacted to provide protection to the victims of physical and mental abuse from, from persons who they reside with or some familial, familial violence. But again, it excludes heterosexual unions. And the concerns when it comes to the resources in the, in, in, in the state's uh, arsenal is also something that came out in, in the research itself. We see where uh, persons are have little hope and faith in the law. And it sometimes is, is seen when, when persons do not even seek, seek help in those regards because of the little faith in the law. So it's a, it's a melting pot of what, discrimination and, 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 and when violence is meted out to certain communities, it's either they don't seek help or the system itself acts as a, as a source of oppression. The, the laws in itself, although the government now in the country, as we speak, saying that they, they, they will do more. And we heard the prime minister recently um, talking about doing more to have a peace and justice initiative to deal with violence. We still need more work. We still need structural changes to happen. I'm, I'm hoping that this research will be taken on board to assist in that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naticia. Um, again, reminder to everyone to um, add any questions you might have so we can pick them up in the Q&A um, at the end. And we now go to the third case study. I should say that uh, each case study focuses not just on a different context, but on a different level of the problem as well in some ways. Um, while Dolores uh, looks at the experiences at the local level, um, Naticia looks at the structures, so to say, and experiences at the national level. Tanya, um, who, who we will turn to now, looks at some of the responses and some of the action against. So um, third, we have uh, Tanya Cecilia Martinez, who in her work focuses on democratic governance and the collaboration between government and civil society groups to improve citizen participation in their own governance and development context. So Tanya, drawing on your research from Honduras, what role young women's involvement plays in the context of tackling chronic violence and creating social cohesion and even peace? Yeah, thank you, Elena. Thank you for your question. And thank you, everyone, for being here with us. Yes, and well, in Honduras, I want to mention that 51% uh, of Honduran population are women. And that percentage, 29, are young women. And uh, young women in Honduras face uh, challenges in different areas of their lives. Despite this, uh, what I found in this case study were young women who are fighters who, with clearness about what they had to do. The young women who were involved in this research um, show tremendous potential to lead in shaping efforts as they are actively striving to contribute for a more equitable and peace society in Honduras. About their role, I found that they have um, roles as agents of change. These young women serve as a catalyst for change within their communities. They show an active involvement in activities that brings new perspective, ideas, and energy. They participate in projects that are um, address local challenges, contributing uh, to improvement of their communities. All of them are working for positive change, promoting inclusive participation and trying to influence decision makers to prevent violence. One of them said, um, when a woman uh, wakes up, she's unstoppable. She generates a social impact. And I believe that. Another thing that I found is uh, the, it's related with community engagement. Their engagement in community activities, whether through volunteering, leaders, uh, leadership roles, or activism, uh, helps connect generational gaps and connects fostering a sense of belonging among different segments of their society. The participants um, emphasize that the importance of organizing and being part of groups that are interested in transforming communities, um, talking about networking, they say the, that these spaces must be open and allow gender roles to be questioned 
um, and they they have the the feeling that they can learn and participate. Another thing that I found is about it's around advocacy and empowerment. These young women advocate for social justice, gender equality, and human rights. And but uh, by advocating uh, for these causes, they amplify marginalized voices, challenge stereotypes, and work uh, towards creating more equitable uh, communities. According to this opinion, education and inclusion of young women are key factors to promote safe spaces and citizen engaged to participate in positive changes. Um, the, there is a need for more open and, and accessible ways to be heard and influenced in public policy. In addition, uh, one of this, uh, the interviews mentioned that the need of, for opportunities to access financial resources to implement projects for young women. And the other thing that I found is they are role models and mentors. These young women uh, serve as a role models for young generations, inspiring and mentoring others to take an active role against violence. Their leadership is in different areas, encourages others to strive for personal growth and community uh, involvement. Um, and the, the, the other thing that I want to mention is that they are promoters of dialogue. They often facilitate dialogue and create safe spaces for discussions on crucial issues. This foster understanding, tolerance, and cooperation among community members contributing to a more cohesive uh, society. Overall, the involvement of young women in communities is integral uh, to nurturing social cohesion by promoting this inclusivity, diversity, empowerment, and dialogue, leading to a more resilient and uh, society. Those young women have given me hope and, and the responsibility to continue working for a better future. They, for me, they are the voice for of those who cannot yet speak. Thank you so much, Tanya. And it's really good to hear um, and, and you know lift hope um, as a political uh, act as well um, mm -hmm. in this uh, launch today. So we heard from uh, Tanya how young women are leading advocacy and, uh, and responses to violence um, in the context of Honduras. Dolores and Noticia, um, did you see any trends in how women and other marginalized gender groups are addressing violence in Mexico and Jamaica? Dolores, perhaps? I mean, whoever wants to go first, but uh, Dolores, I, I, I'd like to start with you maybe. Well, I think actually, and as we, not only by uh, reading or reviewing the case studies, but as we work together in this fellowship, um, we found so many things in common. I mean, I think at the end, we focus on a specific uh, subject or topic from our context in our countries, but um, at the end, all these things are related. I see also how there are challenges um, in, in Mexico, as the ones that Natisha uh, talks about or address in, in her case study. And additionally, I think it's um, really enlightened the context of uh, what girls are living and how to address this uh, from that perspective in this specific group in Mexico. And I think that's um, one of the main key, key takeaways of, uh, all the whole, of the whole report because we focus on a particular context, but we can take those experiences and translate them to different, uh, not only between our case studies, but to different realities um, in like um, increasing the, the impact that we can have from the report. So I, I think that I could relate any of the aspects, uh, just finding like the um, correct target population and relate that. So I think what that that's something of um, that I would better better come up, like take away from from their report and the intersection of the three cases that is of course. Thank you so much, Dolores. Natisha. I I'd say the agency aspect in in its broadest framework because I for especially for marginalized populations in Jamaica, the, the survival mechanisms employed in their situations it's just out of this world when you do not have laws assisting you on a day-to-day -day basis to navigate the, 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 the discrimination and all the things you face you you become resilient and and and, and kind of grow into this this person 
whether or not you 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 ever think you were capable. And so that within itself, as as Delora said, yes, from we started the fellowship and even when we were doing our conversations with the peacemaker, we were already in tune with the familiar terrains. And, and so when we were brought together, I could understand why. Our situation is the same when you look at um, Honduras and, and, and the report that was, that was written recently. I can relate when it comes to the gangs and how the, the approach that one must take. So it's quite cross-cutting, but if I was to pinpoint one thing, it would be agency. That that agency. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. And your case studies, uh, case study in particular, actually all of the case studies, but your in particular really teases out the intersectional aspect of that too. Um, okay, so um, one more question. Um, this report really focuses on national and at times, I mean, some part of it also at international level policies and frameworks as Phoebe was highlighting. Um, can you each speak a bit more about how policies could be perhaps better leveraged to address chronic violence in a gender responsive way? Before we get to recommendations specifically, whoever wants to start. You'll have to unmute. Uh... I'll just quickly go first so I can send it over to my colleagues. I, I think that we we need to stay. I, I would love to see my my country and the Caribbean stay as close as we can to the to CEDA and its and its evolution and how we we now should incorporate gender lenses in 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 an, our approach to policies and not just to the policies but also to and, I, and I'll say my country breaks it into preventative and protective and in both aspects it's, there are shortcomings. So I believe that if we are truly serious about the, the, the two international threads of human rights, which is non-discrimination and inequality, then we need to take a closer look at the prescriptions uh, as to what we sign on to. Our countries have already ratified and, and um, very much putting forward that they are adhering to these principles. Um, gender is something that is overlooked in, in, in predominantly black populations. And I can say that with certainty because of the work I do. I think by, by incorporating it from the theoretical framings to the active and, 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 and implementation stages, we're better able to serve the, the most vulnerable and marginalized populations in our region. Great, thank you, Mrs. Yeah. Um, thank you, and it's also good to see how you bring in uh, the experience from your everyday work as well, obviously in the case study, uh, but also in, 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 in highlighting some of the important aspects here for us today. Um, Dolores or Tanya, any of you, um, anything on this question? Well, I think that actually that was the first reason that I decided to work also focus on Guadalajara and in the aspect of urban areas. It is important to consider uh, people's perception of violence and crime at the neighborhood level to be able to rebuild those social relations from the grassroots. If national governments and the global agenda doesn't manage to do that, we're going to be in the same place as where we are right now. And a proof of this was given by the international community. We started with the MDGs in 2000, then we noticed that we needed to include uh, more action from the grassroots, from the local level, from individual level. Then we came out with the 2030 agenda, and in 2030, I bet that we're going to keep struggling in, in reaching those goals. So I think um, it is important not only have the framework from the national uh, level, but have that advocacy and that agency that Leticia was mentioning. We need to effectively implement those frameworks and to guarantee the right of people to fulfill and trip in a safer context. So if we don't do that and if we don't consider a bottom top perspective, I think it's going to be really hard to do it. We're going to keep living in these two realities that I mentioned, the ones that are in figures and numbers and reports and the ones the ones that we live in our daily basis. Thank you, Dolores. And that's such a key uh, reminder as well, because oftentimes we talk about um, violence and gender. Maybe we talk about that at the international level, what more can be done, what more can be done at the national level. But as you remind us, really, 
it all has to resonate with the local level, otherwise we've done very little. Um, Tanya? Yeah, thank you. I just, I, I agree with my dear fellow friends. I just wanted to add that um, this is a huge phenomenon. So in, as we have been talking about this, uh, it's not, I don't know, it's a, an illusion, but we have to work on this integral or comprehensive frameworks that interconnect policies because you have to attack different things, um, health, uh, job opportunities, and citizen security. So it's, it's, it has to be interconnected. And there are many initiatives in Honduras that are trying to, to, to fight against uh, violence against women and, and, and girls. Uh, and those have to be integral. And, and it's a process also. I just want to mention that, that it's a process that it needs time, it needs resources. And it's it needs the, the collaboration of of all the, the the parties in, in society. Wonderful, thank you, Tanya. So uh, there's a question that I'll try. I'll ask you if you want to answer it. I'll answer it very briefly, so we can go to recommendations in time as well. And the question is um, um, from Kay, who is actually uh, one of the Women Peacemaker Fellows for for this next year. Um, so she asks to all peacemakers. Some stakeholders often have a narrow view of what constitutes women, peace, and security issues and what doesn't. In your respective context, what kind of policy advocacy arguments do communities in your country make to broaden the need to address chronic violence within the framework of the WPS agenda? So anyone, if, there's, if, if you have any thoughts. Okay. <laughs> Well, I could just say that I have been searching for OWA policy on women, peace, and security here in Jamaica for quite some time. I have not located any in its in its you know specific form. I, I gather there are some intentions, but but again, like all our legislations, they're very scattered and they're embedded in various policies and framing. So if you have the time, like if I look in the periodic review. Um, the UN period review, I may be able to, to see a reporting from the government as to how they deal with peace and security. But there's nothing that is so specific that I can say update or or you know organize our own legislation, which you, which you may know outside of our constitution, a, an act is is high in terms of um, hard law. So I think a lot more should be done. I think it's a it's an advocacy point. When I got involved in this fellowship and, and I realized that we're focusing on chronic violence is something that I want to be an advocate about in its, in its particular frame because there's a need, especially moving away from the peace and security that we know in, in, in the advocacy around peace and security in conflict time and recognizing as most of the publications that we're, we're, we have done and, and the ones offshoot from this, that, that there are some structural things that allows for us to have to consider peace and security in this realist form. Thank you, Nancy. And indeed, this is the, one of the uh, key points that the report tries to make, that we need a broader understanding um, of violence, that it would include context of chronic violence as well. OK, so I'm mindful of time. So I will ask each fellow now, in one minute, to tell us what are two key recommendations for addressing chronic violence in your context. I should also remind the audience that there are detailed recommendations in the report itself, and I strongly encourage you to look at those. But for now, let's focus on the two key ones. Um, Tanya, I'll start with you if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yes, I, I have many recommendations, very good ones that uh, the participants and I want to thank them for for trust me and, and share all their experience. Um, I, I'm trying to, to group them because there are many for government and, and civil society. Um, and I will say that I will pick something that I've mentioned before. I think that there is a, a, a need to establish integrated support networks also. Talking about comprehensive frameworks um, that, uh, as I said, interconnect policies, but funding also and education programs fostering collaboration among government institutions, NGOs, and communities, and international cooperation also. And this, this um, they were saying that this should be like a network that focuses on eradicating violence against young women, promoting gender equality, and ensuring 
uh, inclusive spaces for them. And the, also, the other thing is that he has to emphasize both in urban and rural areas. And I think that is very important. And the other thing that connects what uh, Natisha said before is in the empowerment through legislation and awareness. Um, this is it's about enforced legislation against harassment. That was very mentioned in my case study. And, and while launching widespread communication campaigns, uh, these efforts should not only raise public awareness about chronic violence, but also create safe spaces for dialogue, amplifying the voices and priority of young women. Uh, this approach aims to cultivate an environment where young women feel secure, supported, and empowered to participate uh, fully in their communities. Wonderful. Thank you, Tanya. One minute to you, Dolores. Well, I think I will go for a more subjective or romantic perspective. I think that we need to go back to basics. Uh, the people-centered narrative tells us that we are in a collective and individual trauma in which families and communities need to work together to pop, to path those paths of healing from violence. And therefore, my key recommendations would be first, go back and relate to your neighbors in a way that is informed by the vision that you have for a better life for yourself and your loved one. We need to go back to that basic of feeling and relate differently with our neighbors. And secondly, of course, to center women's experiences and leadership to build inclusive community initiatives that can contribute to heal that trauma left by violence and to better address um, this context that we're living on. I think uh, considering how women live in their family, the social and professional life, and how they perceive, perceive and navigate the cities for, for sure would help to change the community's uh, reality. Um, we need tailor-made innovative um, solutions for all, so I think that would be my two key takeaways. Thank you so much, Dolores. And Leticia? Well, I'll go specifically for my context, um, something I said earlier, which is to make the link between the national and international realities and to see how best we can evolve as especially Jamaica as a post-independent society since some of our laws are so embedded in these archaic legislations that no longer serve a modern Jamaican society. So that is my first. And quickly just to say that in the, in, in the overall thing, I think we, we need to have a holistic people-centered approach at our national level realities to deal with this phenomenon um, as a manifestation of chronic violence, gender-based violence is, is wreaking havoc for lack of better terminologies and on the people that cannot fight for themselves or to speak for themselves. And so I think better government intervention is needed. Explicitly, um, we see where policies and institutions are not serving the people and therefore they need to ensure that these legal architectures are not just reproducing gender and intersectional inequalities. So arguing for our centering of gender experiences and perspective on chronic violence um, and that it, it's critical that societal changes be lasting and therefore our overall of the laws at this time is the way forward. Thank you so much, Natisha, and thank you all three for giving us this teaser um, into what the report offers. Um, thank you for your powerful, succinct words today. Um, I encourage everyone to, to read the report and not just read it, but share it further with, uh, with those who you feel they need to read it as well. Um, thank you, Brianna, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you on the panel. And I, again, thank you for sharing your insights, your expertise. I think we really heard common themes around the need for uh, comprehensive support, multi-sectoral types of programming. So thank you so much. As we move to close our event, it's my privilege to welcome Susan Marks, who served as an international partner for this project. Thank you so much, Susan, for your partnership across the last year. Susan is the director of the human rights programs for the Carter Center. And prior to moving to Atlanta in the summer of 2022, she spent 17 years doing human rights work in Iraq, Afghanistan, Timor-Leste, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you for being with us, Susan. Thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, based on my on my lived experience of, of having lived and worked largely on women's rights programs in, 
in all of these countries mentioned, uh, Brianna, it was just so enlightening to 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 read this report and and to listen to this engaging discussion that you all have uh, have have presented to us today. So I also want to just thank the opportunity to the Croke Institute for us to be able to partner with you. Uh, and my specific uh, congratulations go out to Natasha, Maria, Tanya, uh, Elena, Elisa, everybody that worked on this. And forgive me if I if I forgot somebody's name. I try to catch everybody's names. Um, I think, you know, from a practitioner's perspective that have designed and implemented so many programs specifically targeting violence against women, what, what really struck me about your report is how representative it was of the complexities of, of intersectionality, um, particularly faced by women, uh, uh, you know, who experience violence around the world. And I think that your case studies uh, in this particular, you know, in this particular report was was very representative uh, of that. So a few key uh, things that stood out for me. I think your report underscores not only the prevalence of violence, but also the fact that violence against women is, as you say, endemic. It's not episodic. This is not something that that just happens when there's something bad going on in the country, even though it may exacerbate it. But but the endemic nature of, of, of violence against women, which is why we see uh, the global statistic, one in three women will experience violence by an intimate partner, is is almost globally applicable. It's not only in countries you know, with 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 lower uh, uh, economic, um, uh, uh, you know, indicators and so forth. So rather than just occurring in places of, of, of conflict, it persists throughout uh, because it is so deeply rooted in this patriarchal reality and the patriarchal society. Um, you know, we see this in our work in West Africa as well, Latin America, um, where I've worked, Afghanistan, Eswatini, it's, it's, it's always true. Some of the things that you talked about today that stood out for me as well is the link between chronic violence uh, and other factors that contribute to this normalization of violence. And I think that's where we get into real trouble is when societies start normalizing and saying, oh, that's just the way it that's just the way we do it, you know, whether it be cultural or traditional. Unfortunately, bringing in the faith aspect here, I think, is also important. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of societies will say, oh, well, this is this is part of our faith. And then when you start unpacking those, you find it's not true. Um, another thing I, I heard was the intersectional gender analysis and why it matters, how we have to look at different groups very differently because they experience violence differently based on age sexuality, their different uh, experiences of gender. I think I think it's really important that you 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 shine such an intentional light on that. Um, I think the so we talked about the 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 intersectionality. I think your inclusivity when addressing gender is really uh, important in the report. Uh, you know, looking at women's issues, race, LGBTQI uh, plus communities. Uh, uh, you know, it also mentions uh, the, the, how how we identify as male as having a hegemonic masculinity, uh, you know these are these are incredibly important. And as a practitioner, again, you know we can't work on gender issues without also working with men and boys. You know this transformation of normative behaviors and and, and values. Um, I would say that 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 again, focusing on women is not meant to be exclusive, but rather inclusive, as it acknowledges how variances in the identity plays into laws and policies as well. That gender blind policies affect all humans negatively. You know this notion that when you do women's rights work, it's at the cost of men. You know, rather than looking at it as improving the whole society, which I think is very important. I think the report. Um, reminds us that this awareness and emphasis on inclusivity requires organizations to be very intentional about it. So I take, you know, perhaps less of an academic look at it as as you all may. And I look at it from an organizational perspective, a practical perspective. How can I take your research and implement it practically? And for me, it's about intentionality. It's about looking at appropriate gender studies, looking at assessments, looking at building capacity for practitioners in the field working on these issues to be able to understand this. For example, we recently did uh, a whole gender assessment of all of our peace programs, but at the same time also brought in a DEI trainer who herself is the first ever uh, openly transgender person that was appointed to a senior U.S. government um, uh, position, you know, so being very, very intentional about it. A couple more points I'll make uh, in, in, in the interest of time. Uh, takeaway for me is that our solutions need to be holistic, 
while addressing the whole ecosystem of support needed to address this problem beyond just the laws that you mentioned, no matter how good they are. Uh, um, the, the example of Haiti, you know, laws requires implementation. Rather, we require prevention, protection, services, legal reform, but also looking at uh, the only way to shift this, na this nature of violence against women is to address the root causes. And, and, and again, I come back to societal transformation vis-a-vis -vis the understanding of gender as well as intentional commitment to women's leadership and participation while working closely with men and boys. Um, again, I'll just emphasize the importance of centering women in the solutions. So a recent example for us is rather than attending COP28, we sponsored three indigenous women to, to, uh, to attend a COP and represent their communities. We can't talk about, oh, you know, indigenous, uh, importance of indigenous voices in the climate if we're not going to, if we're not going to give them, you know, a seat at the table. So that's, that's some of the ways that, that we've recently engaged. I'll skip over some of the other things. Um, it was much more interesting to listen to you all. I'll make two or three last closing points. Framework, CEDAW, SDGs, WPS, yes, needed at the national level. But beyond that, as Dolores pointed out, uh, the importance of working at all different levels of society, from the individual, the community, and then the policy level as well, and how and how they interact with each other. Um, and, and again, I'll just shine the light on, on the importance for those of us that, that implement in these programming, that we need to program, put funding, put support. Oftentimes, women know what they need but they need funding, they need political and other coverage, they need assistance with strategy, um, and, and they need networking, they need, they need community, they need uh, us to amplify um, their, their work. So I'll stop there, just one minute over, um, and just again, congratulate the researchers. It was magnificent. Uh, it was a great privilege to work with you all on this. Thank you so much, Susan. <clears throat> we will close out, and thank you all so much, to all the panelists, to all the speakers, um, it's been an incredible experience to work with you. Thank you all for being with us here today. On the screen, if you choose, use that QR code, you can read the full report and standalone case studies as well. And of course, please follow us on social media. The report is available in both English and Spanish. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being part of a community working to address these challenging, intractable issues and to work, as Tanya said, to support and empower women to participate fully in their communities. So thank you so much for being with us today.